good evening. Thank you all very much for being here. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. I have a tendency to talk too fast, and I have a tendency to get quieter and quieter. So if I'm talking too fast or if I'm talking too softly, give me a holler and I will stop and correct myself. <laughs> um, I also want this to be interactive. And so if you have a pressing question while I'm talking, you can raise your hand and interrupt me and we can address it then. Um, you also have, I believe, pieces of paper to write down questions. You will forget them if you don't ask them or write them down. That's what always happens. So please take advantage of those tools and either interrupt me or use your notepad so that you can have all your questions answered. And if you do forget them, don't worry because I'm not going anywhere. All right, let's get started. All right, so anytime I give a talk, I have to say a little bit about my research funding. My position is only 25% clinical and it's 75% research. And I have research funding from the National Institutes of Digestive and Dis Digestive and Diseases of the Kidney, which is one of the branches of NIH. Um, and I study ways to improve women's access to treatments for both urinary and bowel incontinence. Um, I am also the principal investigator for an industry-funded trial called Liberate, which is testing the long-term success of a device to treat accidental bowel leakage. This is the device. I'll be talking a little bit more about it. The company does not pay me in any way, but I do, I am the principal investigator for the research study. So that's important for you to know as background about me. And then I also have on here as a disclosure that everybody poops. So we all have, you know, we're talking about a sensitive topic tonight, and I just want to start by saying we all do it. And I talk about it all day, every day, and I feel very comfortable talking about it. Um, so I hope you don't mind. I'm going to use a little bit of humor because I think that makes it easier. Um, and as we go through, hopefully you will also get comfortable talking about it. So I'm going to talk about a few things. Oh, and I have a one and a half year old son. He is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Do not tell my husband, please. <laughs> and um, so I have pictures of him throughout this talk. So, you know, in case this the topic itself turns your stomach a little bit. I hope he'll keep you engaged. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what ABL is, or accidental bowel leakage, why it happens, how we can make it better, and then discussion and questions. And please interrupt me. If there's a burning question while I'm talking, you don't need to wait. We can make this. We've got an hour and a half together, and we can use it however you want. OK. So, what is accidental bowel leakage? This is my son with ducks. He loves ducks. And ducks, by the way, have a lot of accidental bowel leakage. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, most doctors refer to ABL as fecal incontinence, which is the involuntary loss of liquid or solid stool that is a social or hygienic problem. Now, we all start out with fecal incontinence when we're babies, and nobody considers it a problem because it's to be expected. But when we get older and we develop the same issues, all of a sudden it's a problem. Anal incontinence means you have loss of flatus or gas, but not necessarily liquid or solid stool. And fecal urgency is the, when I've got to go, I've got to go. I can't wait 15 minutes, I have to go now. And so some people don't actually lose stool, but are very bothered by that urgency. And that can be just as bothersome or, or even more bothersome than just having accidental bowel leakage or fecal incontinence. So when I give talks about this topic to doctors, this is a talk I gave last week to the geriatricians, the trainees who are going to take care of older adults. 
Um, and the title is, If We Don't Ask, They Don't Tell, How to Handle Fecal Incontinence. I'm giving a talk to you this week, and I'm saying, tackling the taboo, let's talk about accidental bowel leakage. So why am I using that language here and this and the, the language fecal incontinence with doctor? Well, it's because it's easier to communicate if we use common language. And when I was a fellow, which is part of one of the steps in training to get to be a real subspecialist like I am, um, I analyzed data from a large survey of over 5,000 women, U.S. women, it was an internet survey, and about 1,000 of them had fecal incontinence. But when we asked them if they'd ever heard of fecal incontinence, less than a third had ever heard of that term. And 44% had ever heard the term bowel incontinence. So people experiencing the symptoms didn't use that terminology. And one of the other questions that we asked in the survey was how would you prefer to describe this problem? And over 70% of women in this survey preferred the term accidental bowel leakage. Every time I talk to doctors about this, they freak out. They really want to use the term that they learned fecal incontinence or bowel incontinence. And, you know, and I say, I hear you. That's always what I called it, too. But I have to listen to these, you know, thousand women and their preferences. And so when I'm giving a talk to a community of people, I use the term that most people prefer, which is accidental bowel leakage or ABL. And I want to point out that this is not unique, using different terms to talk about a condition. If you think about impotence, does anybody use the word impotence anymore? Everybody says ED, erectile dysfunction. Oh, it's like kind of cute to talk about ED. It's no big deal. What we hope is that using this terminology, ABL, will make it a little easier to talk about a similarly stigmatized condition. Um, so accidental bowel leakage, fecal incontinence, bowel incontinence, they're all synonyms for the same symptoms, not dissimilarly from erectile dysfunction and impotence. And overactive bladder is another one that you've probably heard before. And other medical terms to describe that are urinary urgency, urinary frequency, and urge incontinence. So lots of times, tackling the taboo is all about comfort. If a term sounds like a mouthful, don't use it. Use what's comfortable for you. Um, and I always say, whatever, whatever it is that you like to call it, that's what we'll call it. My patients call their symptoms all sorts of things, and I make a note in their chart, and next time I use their terminology. So I don't care what you call it. I just want you to feel comfortable to talk about it. So what isn't ABL or accidental bowel leakage or fecal incontinence or bowel incontinence or your visitors or whatever you call it? It is not something that only happens to you. I can't tell you how often I hear that people thought they were the only one. It's not a normal part of aging. It's common as we age, but it's certainly not normal or, or expected or inevitable. It's not because of something you did. Lots of people have this feel, they feel alone. They feel like they're the only person who has this problem. And so they, they rack their brains to try to figure out what it is they did. That, why did this happen to them? It's not something you did. And it's not something you have to live with. It's also not just a female problem. So this is a Healthy Women, Healthy Communities talk. I'm an OBGYN, and now I do pelvic floor specifically. Um, but this problem is equally common in women and men. This is a survey published by Bill Whitehead, who's a very famous researcher in fecal incontinence <coughs> at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And this is data published from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which is a very rigorous epidemiologic survey. And about 10% of adults have monthly fecal incontinence. And if you use a, uh, a definition that spans a longer time than just a month, the prevalence is actually twice that. The prevalence increases with increasing age, just like most things. 
the longer you're around, the more likely you are to develop any condition. So the prevalence of ABL does increase with age in both men and women. And about one in six older adults have less frequent leakage. So not necessarily once a month, but once in the last three months. And the reason why is because there are a lot of common conditions associated with ABL. Conditions like IBS. Does anybody know what IBS stands for? Irritable bowel. Yeah, irritable bowel syndrome or other disorders of chronic bowel disturbance, like constipation, chronic diarrhea, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. Diabetes and obesity are also associated with accidental bowel leakage. So are menopause and urinary leakage. And finally, trauma to the pelvic floor, which can happen during childbirth or as a result of treatment for prostate problems, either surgery or radiation. This is a really important condition because it has a significant impact on quality of life. So these are data from that same survey that I told you about at the beginning, the survey where I learned that most women who have this problem would prefer we call it ABL. And in urogynecology, my subspecialty, we do a lot of patients, you know, things like incontinence, we take your word for it. We don't do a test to see if you have it. We take your word, you say you have it. And we also believe in measuring impact of symptoms using questionnaires. And there are seven domains that we think are really important. And they're the first seven domains in this questionnaire. And this is in a sample of women who had ABL once in the last year. Now, some people had it every day, some people had it every week, some people had it once every two months. But 40% reported a severe negative impact in one of these quality of life domains. That's a really big number. That number is much bigger than when you look at women who have urinary leakage once in the last three months. So this problem is very bothersome. It has a severe impact on quality of life. And it also has a severe impact on our emotional health. And these data are presented in kind of a funny way. But over here on the left side, this is zero. And over here on the right side would be 100%. And then this pale white line in the middle is 50%. So more than 50% of women in the sample agreed with the statement, I fear I will have an accident in public. And well more than 50% agreed with the statement, I wish I could get my normal life back, the way it was before I had this condition. Almost half, I have good days and bad days, and it is out of my control. These are, you know, these are bad feelings. When you feel like something's out of your control, that's a big deal. This condition is also expensive. This is a lot of analysis that I don't even really understand. But the bottom line is the estimated total cost per person per year in 2010 dollars is over $4,000. And that's about half of the cost per year per person for diabetes. So if you think about how much attention we pay to diabetes, it's sort of shocking that we pay so little attention to ABL. So whatever you call it, I hope you agree with me that it's a problem. Hi, come on. <laughs> and I hope everybody at home is laughing. <laughs>
happen to have this little model here, which this is front wave and this is to the side. Symphysis pubis here and tailbone here. And this is the rectum and the anal canal. On this illustration on the slide, you can see that there's a little angle between the rectum and the anal canal. And that angle is maintained by this muscle, which is creatively named the puborectalis. It goes from the pubic bone and wraps around the rectum, and it maintains that anal rectal angle. We also have two muscles down here, the internal anal sphincter and the external anal sphincter. And those are two muscles that also squeeze to hold the anal canal shut. Communication is really key in life in general and also with maintaining bowel continence. And I'm not going to go through this picture. This picture terrifies my residents. I like to show it just to get their heart racing because they think I'm going to ask them to remember things from medical school. But what I want to point out is that actually your anal rectum communicates with your brain. So, you know, <laughs> you actually have to find out what's down there. Because if, you know, when something arrives in your rectum, you need to know this is gas. And, you know, now would probably not be the ideal place to release it. But if you were out in the hallway and there was nobody else around, that would be fine. And you would just go ahead and release it. Or sometimes what's arrived in your rectum is loose stool because you ate Mexican from the taco truck last night and you've got to get to the bathroom right now. And sometimes it's just regular form stool and you have time. But you actually need to know what's in your rectum. And so there's this very complicated mechanism of communication of when something arrives in your rectum that sends that message up to your brain so that you can process that information and do something with it. And so it's actually this coordinated dance. So when something arrives in the rectum, the internal anal sphincter actually relaxes to allow some of that content to go down into the tunnel of the anal canal because that's where the nerves are that tell your brain what it is. And what should happen at the same time is that the external anal sphincter, which is a muscle you control, should squeeze tight to push the stool back up into the rectum. You can imagine that if we lose our coordination a little bit, that sampling reflex can just, you know, bypass us, and then stool is delivered to our rectum, goes into the anal canal for sampling, but doesn't get pushed back into the rectum, and instead slips right on out. In fact, one of the physical therapists tells my patients, oh, don't worry, you're just losing your sample. You just need to work on getting your sample back up. So, like I said, I don't care what you call it. Just as long as you have something that makes it comfortable for you to talk about so that we can work together and make you better, that's what's important. So, I went through that just so that you understand that it's really a complicated process. And in order for us to hold on to our tools, we need a lot of things. We need intact muscles. We need intact nerves. We need normal rectal compliance, which means that the rectum has to be able to, ex to expand in order to receive stool when it's delivered to the rectum. We need to have normal stool consistency, just like it's easier to hold clay in your cupped hands than it is to hold liquid. The same thing applies to our stool consistency. And we need to have normal cognitive function so that we can interpret that message that's being sent from our anus up to our brain and make an appropriate decision about it. So the risk factors for incontinence are the things that compromise those prerequisites for continence. So if your muscles are compromised because of injury, surgery, trauma, obstetric, or being born without certain muscles that you need, you're at risk for this problem. If your nerves are compromised, either from something like spina bifida, a spinal cord or nerve injury, diabetes, a prior stroke, multiple sclerosis, any of those things can impact uh, your ability to process those signals and coordinate. If you don't have 
have normal rectal compliance, which is, like I said, the ability for the rectum to expand to receive the delivery of stool, which can happen from radiation, proctocolitis, cancer, surgical resection, or impaction. So if you're, so lots of times women say, I don't understand this, I'm constipated, how can I be having this problem? Well, if your rectum is chock full of hard stool, it essentially has no compliance. There's nowhere for it to expand to receive new stool when stool is delivered. So even constipation can predispose to this problem. If you have something that gets in the way of normal stool consistency, like chronic diarrhea or constipation, IBS, irritable um, inflammatory bowel disease, or if you have something that compromises your ability to process that information, which could be dementia or could be delirium if you're in the hospital and you've been put on too many pain medicines. Um, and this is data from a, a paper that I published a while back, and I don't expect you to understand this, and it's a busy slide, but what I want to draw your attention to is that the bigger the number is, the higher it is associated with ABL. And the thing with the biggest number here is having a bowel disorder. So if you have an underlying disorder of constipation or diarrhea or IBS, that really increases your risk of having ABL more than having a uh, prior vaginal delivery. That number is only 1.28 versus 4.13. So the big risk factors, the things that are strongly associated with ABL are having a bowel disorder, having urinary leakage, because it's the same muscles that control those, having had a prior stroke or having diabetes. I was really disappointed to see that being married was protective. It decreased your risk. <laughs> so I immediately went out and got married. <laughs> um, so accidental bowel leakage is more common in older adults, those with bowel disorders, those with diabetes, those with neurological disorders, those with a history of prior pelvic surgery or radiation, those who've had a traumatic vaginal delivery with a tear of the anal sphincter, and those who have urinary incontinence. So when I give this talk to doctors, I say, even if you don't want to talk about this with everybody, at least talk about it with these people, which is actually most of the people we take care of. I mean, most people have one of these risk factors. And most people who have this problem actually have pretty mild symptoms. So this is, uh, this Wexner 420 is complete loss of solid liquid stool and gas every day, needing to use constipating medicines, needing to wear pads. That's somebody who's got severe disease. And on this side, this is like one issue once a month. Most people who have this problem have mild symptoms, which is good news because that's easier to fix than more severe symptoms. So what can we do to make it better? And there are therapies where you have to think inside the box, and there are therapies where you have to think outside the box. There are lots of good solutions available. Lifestyle and behavior modifications help most people, as does pelvic floor physical therapy, mostly because of that coordinated dance that I talked about earlier. And for folks who still have symptoms after those two things, there are medicines, devices, and surgeries that can be helpful. So now I'm going to sort of transition into solutions. But why don't I stop, because we've covered quite a bit, and ask if there are questions right now before we move on to solutions. Yes? Um, would okay, the question is, would colonoscopies be a cause of this problem? Um, so the bowel prep certainly is a cause of this problem because it basically makes your stool like water, which makes it hard for even somebody who doesn't have any problems to control their stool. A colonoscopy on its own should not cause this problem but might be ordered to evaluate this problem. Because anytime we have changes in stool consistency, we doctors have this red flag that goes up in the back of our head. 
is this person up to date on their colorectal cancer screening? We should probably check because we don't want to miss that. So that's a treatable problem. I'm thinking about possibly damage to the tissue. Yeah, so, and the question is, does a colonoscopy damage the tissues? In general, a colonoscopy should not damage these tissues. Now, there are other operations that do damage these tissues. And when I was a fellow, I did a rotation with the colorectal surgeons, and some of the instruments that they routinely insert through the anal canal, I thought, dear Lord, they are keeping me in business with these things. But really, a colonoscopy should be a thin enough instrument that it shouldn't cause irreversible damage. Any other questions about what is ABL and what causes it? Why does it happen? Yeah. With the colonoscopy, if there's a polyp or something, is that actually goes with that? If there's, so the question is if there's a polyp removed at the time of the colonoscopy, can that cause the problem? And there, are, I have not seen a study showing that either colonoscopy or having a polyp removed does. But certainly, if you have a, a large section of your bowel removed, that this problem is much more common because you get chronic diarrhea as a result. But in isolated polyp resection, most people would not develop symptoms after that. I feel like I would just get killed if I said, yes, colonoscopy is causing this problem. <laughs> my, colorectal, my colorectal cancer screening colleagues would say, what are you doing? Yes. How damaged does the nerves have to be before we start surgery? Are all the people with ovaries? Yeah, so this is a great question. The question is, how damaged do the nerves have to be before you start having a problem with ABL? Thinking about all the people who have low back pain, particularly in the sacrum. The nerves that really control bowel and bladder function are mostly S3 and S4. So pretty low down. Um, and the way I think about it is actually most people can handle one problem with their continence mechanism. Oftentimes, I see ladies who had a big anal sphincter tear when they were 25, and then they didn't get symptoms until they were 55. And the reason why is because that anal sphincter tear alone wasn't enough to cause the problem. But then when they went through menopause and their tissue lost some of its elasticity and their pelvic floor muscles got weaker and then they got put on a diabetes medicine which made their stool soft and they put on 20 pounds, then the problem happened. So the question of how much damage tips you over, I think in large part depends on what other um, things are damaging your continence mechanism or, or impairing your continence mechanism might be a better way to say it. Yes? I, I was late, so I don't know if this question has been asked, but I'm wondering what is your thoughts on what is the relationship between this kind of problem and the potential of cancer? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. The question is, what is the relationship between this type of problem and the potential for cancer? And the answer is, we always worry about that. Doctors, we're always worried about missing something that could be dangerous. If you have a sudden change in your stool consistency, or if you see blood in your stool, or if you're losing weight in addition to having changes in your bowel, <coughs> I'm so sorry. Those are all things that increase our that put us on high alert. But if you've had problems with accidental bowel leakage for a decade, that's unlikely to be, that then we're not going to be as worried about missing a cancer. Should we move on? All right. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about management. I always like to start with the things that won't hurt and then move into the things that might hurt. <laughs> so optimizing stool consistency, modifying stool delivery, and optimizing muscle strength and coordination are things that won't hurt anybody. We can also manage skin irritation while you're doing these things that won't 
fix it overnight. Then we move into minimally invasive therapies and maximally invasive therapies, which are surgical options to optimize function and restore anatomy. And we're going to go into a little bit more depth on each of these things. So anybody who's seen me as a patient knows this chart because I make everybody fill it out all the time. This is the Bristol stool chart, and it's a very useful tool to talk about stool consistency. Can anybody guess what the ideal stool type is? Probably four. Yeah, three or four are the ideal. These are the goal stool types. Um, types one and two are on the constipated side. Types six and seven are the too loose side. And everybody's stool consistency varies with what they eat and drink. If you look up Bristol stool chart on the internet, you will find all sorts of reproductions of the Bristol stool chart in edible form. I find them totally entertaining and amusing. This is a cake. Um, but it is a good segue into how you might change the way you eat and drink to improve stool consistency. There are certain foods that can be triggered, and they're not triggers for everyone, but they could be a trigger for you. And so what I recommend is remove one of these foods for a week and see whether it makes a difference, and then move on to the next one. Milk products, caffeine, artificial sweeteners, chocolate, alcohol, spicy foods, Alestra, I don't think that's around anymore, but that was the thing, that was what was in WOW chips, if anybody remembers WOW chips. They basically give you a malabsorptive syndrome, so you just get diarrhea. Um, so paying attention to what things are triggers for you is really important. There are also some tips, tips for healthy bowel habits, which are not easy to do, but they're things that can really help. Eat meals at a predictable time each day. Like toddlers, your bowels like routine. They're, they're better. They don't throw tantrums if they know what to expect. So if you usually eat a big breakfast, eat a big breakfast every day. And if you usually eat a small lunch, eat a small lunch every day. You don't need to eat the same amount of food at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Just be in a predictable pattern so that your body can get used to it. Eating breakfast is pretty important because it starts the digestive process for the day, so try to do that. Eat a high fiber diet that includes both soluble and insoluble fiber, and we'll talk about why. Drink plenty of fluid, preferably decaffeinated, and exercise daily at a consistent time. All of us know that we get constipated if we don't exercise. That's a common problem. Um, and just even if you've got a, a bum hip and so you can't be doing the normal walking that you do, if you can walk in a pool, if you can do something that gets the juices flowing, that will contribute to getting your bowels moving, which is really important for this problem. The gold fiber intake, I'm looking around this room and I'm thinking, you know, so gold fiber intake, if you're a woman over 65, is about 21 grams of fiber per day, not 30 grams of fiber per day. The key to increasing your fiber intake is to do it gradually, because if you do it suddenly, it makes you gassy and bloated and miserable. Um, it can be helpful to talk to a clinical nutritionist or a dietitian. We actually have them in this building, and they can work with you to help you identify how to improve your fiber content. A quick and dirty recommendation from one of my favorite nutritionists is if you can get a serving of a high fiber cereal in the morning and you can eat a serving of beans or lentils at some point during the day, that will give you about 20 grams of fiber. And so if you can incorporate that, you're doing pretty well along with the required uh, fluid to help balance that out. 
If you're constipated, you need more fiber. If you have loose stools, you need more fiber. This is totally counterintuitive, but it's true. And soluble and insoluble fibers are both important. Soluble fiber pulls fluid into stool and makes it a gel-like consistency that can stick together. Insoluble fiber promotes movement through the intestine. If you're constipated, you really need to evacuate the rectum to make space for new stool. And medications can contribute to constipation. <clears throat> Medicines that uh, are antidiarrheal, like Imodium, narcotic or opioid pain medicines, anticholinergic medications, which are often prescribed for bladder problems, antacids like Tums, antidepressant medications, diuretics or water pills, and certain supplements such as calcium and iron can make you constipated. So if you're trying to do the fiber and fluid and things are still bad, talk to your doctor and say, or to your pharmacist and say, are any of the things I'm taking potentially making this problem worse? I have a question. Has research been done on the effect of someone taking bisphenide over a period of years for uh, control of the problem? Um, so the question is, has research been done about taking budesonide uh, over a number of years to control the problem? It is a steroid, right? Mm -hmm. I do not know the answer to that question. Um, so if your stools are too loose, you need more insoluble fiber to absorb the extra water in the stool and more soluble fiber to form that gel-like consistency to stick the stool together. If you're going to take an antidiarrheal medicine, loperamide or Imodium is a little bit better than Lomodal and it's over the counter. Medicines can also make your stools loose, laxatives obviously, antibiotics, antacids, NSAIDs, which are things like ibuprofen, Aleve, aspirin, and oral hypoglycemic agents, which are diabetes medicines, can all make your stools too loose. So again, if the fiber and fluid isn't helping, ask your doctor or pharmacist whether there are changes that you can make. So we also talked about modifying, in addition to optimizing your stool consistency, modifying stool delivery to the rectum. If your problem is urgency and frequent bowel movement, <laughs> then there's really nothing you can do. Your entry is not out. <laughs> no. If your problem is that you have frequent loose stool, taking low pyramide or emodium can be very helpful. If you have occasional symptoms and they're predictable, you can just take Imodium before you're going to do that fun thing that you know will cause a problem. It doesn't have brain side effects, and it can increase the internal anal sphincter tone. So it's a little bit better than Lamotil, which is the other commonly prescribed medicine for this indication. If your problem is constipation, you need to figure out a way to evacuate that rectum so that you maintain a receptacle. And using a good rule of thumb is twice a week you should have a bowel movement that can empty you out. And you can do that either using uh, polyethylene glycol or Miralax, or you can use it from you can do it from below using enemas. In fact, every year I teach an international workshop about bowel dysfunction, and we have a hands-on workshop that's all about rectal irrigation. This, which is huge in Europe. People don't really, people aren't really doing it here, but it's big in other parts of the world to treat this problem. Um, this is where I make a shameless plug for physical therapy because it does, it really works wonders. Women always say, oh, I, I did Kegel exercises, they didn't help. Well, pelvis floor physical therapy is so much more than Kegel exercises. Um, they can help you make behavioral modifications and changes and evaluate whether or not those changes work. They can help you track your symptoms. They do not just muscle strengthening, but also relaxing. It's much harder, truthfully, to relax your pelvic floor muscles than it is to contract them. They can help 
identify other problems. A lot of times what's happened is your puborectalis muscle isn't working anymore because you had a hip problem, and that hip problem ended up making your puborectalis muscle too tight. Or you had a back problem, or a problem with your core muscle strength. So a good pelvic floor physical therapist, and we're fortunate here in Madison to have a lot of them, can actually assess things other than just those pelvic floor muscles to help you really optimize that inner coordination. They can also help you have improved awareness of your bladder, bowels, and pelvic floor muscles using a technique called biofeedback, which is a term that refers to a bunch of different things. But essentially, they have all sorts of tips and tricks to help you get feedback about what's in your rectum, when your rectum is full, when you're squeezing the right muscle. And biofeedback works pretty well. Um, and the percentages here is small and hard to read, but the percentages here are between 60 and 86 percent for reduction in incontinence. I'm going to move on. Yes, there's a question. Is that true for both men and women? Um, so the biofeedback is effective for both men and women. All yes. the other exercises? Yes, and the exercises too. That's a great point. So the um, lots of people see. I am, I am sort of sexist because I always talk about women because that's what I mostly take care of. But the truth is that the only thing that we have that men don't have is a vagina and a uterus. But men have all of these pelvic floor muscles and the same, um, the same sort of support. The bowl of muscles of the pelvic floor supports the openings of the urethra and the anus in men and in women. And so these these therapies that improve muscle coordination and improve rectal sensation work for both men and women. I'm going to move on to management of skin irritation. Um, I always talk about this with my patients. You know, the skin around our anus doesn't ever get weathered. You know, it's just as sensitive now as it was when you were a little baby. And your mom was really careful dabbing and not wiping and putting on desiccant and protecting that skin. And you should be doing the same thing now. The, you know, the uh, traditional toilet paper is made of wood, just like all other paper. And it can really, it can cause tears in that skin, and those tears make life so much worse. So good skin care is really critically important to managing symptoms and improving <clears throat> improving life while you're struggling to get symptoms under control. Um, has anybody heard of the Renew Rectal Insert? This is um, this is what it looks like. It's a little insert that goes inside the anus, and I actually have a couple here. It has a little. Um, <clears throat> For the people watching at home, it's the thing that's pictured that in the hand <coughs> on the upper right, <clears throat> the upper right hand portion of the screen. It has a little inserter. You insert it into your anus, and this stays inside your anal canal. This side is a bridge between the anus and the rectum, so it prevents stool from coming out. And this side stays outside your anus for easy removal so that you can just pinch it and pull it out. <clears throat> and last week, I successfully put this into the model and had it stay there. I don't know if I'll be successful this time, but I'm going to try. So there. That's, that's what it looks like when it works and when it's in place. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually pass this around so that you guys can feel it. You can take it off the inserter and squeeze it. This is expensive. It costs um, $100 for a box of 30. So if you're only going to use it when you have to go somewhere special, that might be affordable. But if you have six bowel movements a day, that's going to add up fast. And that's prescription only. Yeah? You didn't bring up the topic of hemorrhoids at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the question is, I haven't really talked about hemorrhoids, 
um, at all. And the truth is that that the lots of people with hemorrhoids have problems where they end up with stool in their underpants. And I'm trying to figure out, is this a problem where it's hard to get the hemorrhoids clean? Or is this a problem where there's a problem with the anal continence mechanism? If it's a problem with getting clean, then optimizing stool consistency can really help. Um, if it's a problem with, uh, if it's a problem with, if it's actually a continence problem, it's a little harder to sort that out. Oftentimes, hemorrhoidectomies end up making this problem worse. So when people have hemorrhoid surgery, this problem can get worse. And so I end up sort of shying away from talking about it because the truth is that what I try to do when somebody has hemorrhoids is figure out what's the underlying problem here and how can we make, can we make the, can we manage the hemorrhoids through conservative therapies and optimize stool consistency so that they don't cause a problem as opposed to recommending surgical resection or banding. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about in the skin category is butterfly body liner. So they are a, um, a pad product that sticks to the skin of the buttocks rather than sticking to your underpants. So they put the solution where the problem is. And lots of people who have mild ABL tuck toilet paper into their butt crease. And that can obviously slip out and end up coming out down your pant leg. And so these are just kind of nice because they stay where you put them. They do take a little bit of effort to, to get it right and to figure out, but once you start using them, they're pretty effective for light to moderate leakage. And they are, um, they come in a yellow box for women and they come in a gray box for men, but they're the same product. <laughs> um, I, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, yellow seems like a neutral color. I don't know why that just couldn't be for everybody. But. Um, okay, so now I'm going to move to a therapy that's only available for women because it goes inside the vagina. Um, and that is the Eclipse Vaginal Bowel Control System. So, um, how many people have heard of a pessary? Anybody heard of a pessary? Okay, a pessary is a little silicone device that sits inside the vagina to support the walls of the vagina and support the bladder or the uterus. Um, the Eclipse is a pessary that sits inside the vagina, just like a pessary to treat urine leakage or a pelvic organ prolapse, but it has a little balloon that inflates to press against the rectum. So, this is the device when it's when, with the balloon inflated and it sits inside the vagina and that balloon when blown up presses against the rectum so that stool can't slip past. And obviously you wouldn't want this permanently in because then you wouldn't be able to poop and that would be bad. So this has a little tubing. So the tubing hangs out of the vagina like a tampon string and you can inflate and deflate the, the balloon. Um, when I heard about this, I thought, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Well, first I thought there's no way that's going to work. But then they started presenting, I just thought there was no way. So then they started presenting the data and it does work. Um, and, I, and I just thought, wow, this is great. We've got something in the hands of women. The truth is, it takes work to figure out how to get this in your vagina and how to get it out, how to blow up the balloon and deflate the balloon. But it avoids surgery, it controls the problem, and it's in your hands. So <laughs> I don't want to say this is just oh simple because it's not oh simple like other pessaries, but it is a really good solution if you have the if you can go through the effort of blowing up and deflating the balloon. And so the way it works is that you obviously, when you put it in your vagina, you collapse it like this, which people always say, look, oh my gosh, that's huge. And then I have to say, well, you know, babies are, the vagina is made for babies to be able to come out. And this is tiny. Okay. So you put it in collapse and then <coughs> you blow up the balloon 
and then when and then you go about your life problem free and then when you're ready to have a bowel movement you just deflate the balloon <coughs> have your bowel movement and then you just have to remember to reinflate the balloon before you go back to life so this is a very cool new therapy and this is the um, this is the device that I'm one of the principal investigators for a study here at UW, so that was one of my disclosures. So I'm not I'm not trying to endorse the product, but I do think it's a really good option. I'm going to pass this around so you can you know see what it's all about. Um, what are the costs on that one? Oh, the costs on this one. That's a great question. So the truth is I don't know for sure. I believe. That it's somewhere in the five thousand dollar range. Um, can you say that again? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm wondering about insurance coverage. Yeah, the question is about insurance coverage, and the answer is we don't know yet. This. Um, this device has only been made commercially available this year, and actually, I have it in my clinic. Like, I can, I can fit somebody with it. Like, I, I really can pay it hard because I think this is such an important issue, and I want to be somebody who can offer women every solution. Um, so now I have it in my clinic. I have the fit kits and everything. I can fit you if you want one. But the problem is that I don't know if insurance is going to pay for it, and it is expensive. Um, and so we're trying to figure out. We're doing we're doing some sort of testing with Medicare to see whether or not they're going to cover it. They do cover a much more expensive therapy, which I'm going to talk about soon. And so that leads me to believe that we can make the argument to cover this. Um, but having said that, one follow up: What's the yes. longevity of that device? So the question is, what's the longevity of the device? The um, the answer in the paperwork that comes with the device is one year. I have no idea how long it would actually be effective, but that's what the that's what the paperwork says. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the question is, what is it made of? Because Diva cups are good for ten years. Um, this is made of. It's uh, got the stainless steel inner core, and then it's covered with medical grade silicone. Um, it does have a lot of moving parts. I mean, there is. A, I do over the course of the trial that we're doing right now, women use the device for a year, and over the course of the year, there are things that come up where the tubing gets a little break in it, and then we have to replace the tubing and stuff like that. And that stuff is all part of the one year of the device. The company. You know, everything that's part of getting fitted with the Eclipse and using the Eclipse is part of that price. But this is, so this is the problem with the new therapy is that I can't tell you how much it's going to cost because we don't know yet. But it's a, um, but I'm so glad we have it. I'm so glad we have it. Yeah. And the other device that you passed around, you said it's a um, Is that something like pharmacy suspense or do you have to <clears throat> go to your PCP next week and for prescription and, and how would this happen? If you want that, what you should do is contact me and I will give you the website that you can then give your PCP. Your PCP can prescribe it, but you have to do a little bit of hoop jumping. So it's better if I give you the information so that And that's an out of pocket thing you see the church I'm in the oh sorry, the question is, is it Sorry, webinar audience. The question is, this was a question about the rectal insert and the prescription and how to get your PCP to prescribe it. And what I said is, if you're interested in it, then um, I can give you the website to give your doctor because there's a little form you have to fill out to get it prescribed. And then the next question was, is it an out-of-pocket expense or will um, insurance cover it? And I'm currently working with a patient's insurance, writing her a letter of medical necessity trying to get our insurance company to cover it. I don't know whether we'll be successful, but I'm hoping. I mean, you know, the, the squeaky wheel gets paid for ABL, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, now, stay away from politics. Um, <laughs> um, the, 
Uh, oh, I forgot about to mention this other thing. There's also an anal bulking injection that can be done in the office. Um, and I have done it on probably five patients or so, and none of them have gotten a whole lot better. And so I've sort of moved away from including it in my armamentarium. The way it works is by um, injecting some silicone beads into this area of the anal canal right here. So right at the very opening, right at the very opening of the anal canal. So if the problem is that the anal canal is too wide, then injecting these beads might help. But it's, I think that's unlikely to be the problem for most people. And I think that's probably why I haven't seen very good success with it. But it is certainly, uh, it is something that I'm open to doing and it's something that we can argue with insurance to cover. So that's another option that's available for both men and women. Sacral neuromodulation <clears throat> is really one of the big therapies that's used today for ABL. And it was FDA approved for that indication here in this country in 2012, but it's been used in Europe for about a decade. And it's, this is the tailbone or the sacrum. So sacral means the tailbone or sacrum. And the nerves, remember we talked about people with low back pain and nerve problems. The nerves that drive the pelvic floor come down here out of the sacrum. So sacral neuromodulation is modulating or regulating the nerves that drive the pelvic floor. And the way we do it is we put a little wire in through the skin of the back to go along this nerve that drives the bladder and bowels. And then we connect it to an external battery and see whether or not it makes your bowel symptoms better. So you do a trial period. And if it does, then we implant a pacemaker. It looks like this. This is the battery. And that goes under the fat pad of your buttock, and it cycles that electrical current to sort of restore the normal communication between the muscles and nerves of the rectum and the pelvic floor. And then you have this little device that communicates with your battery. So you can actually turn the stimulation up or down, and you can put it, you can switch which program the device is using. This battery lasts for about three to five years. Um, and of the therapies that we have, of the surgical therapies that we have, this is by far the most effective. Um, <clears throat> other than colostomy, probably. Um, so I'm going to pass around these guys, too. Um, who has the rectal insert? OK, perfect. Just <coughs> making sure. Well, when I was a fellow, we did one of the trials of those rectal inserts. And the participants in the study, Everybody kept all of the, you were supposed to turn in the unused devices at the end of the study, and everybody kept them. And so I'm a little paranoid passing around all these things that they're going to get pocketed. And they're not meant for human use. All of these are just demo things. Okay, so I'm passing around the battery and the stimulator. How much is that one? Oh. That one is probably about $20,000. And the insurance covers it. Insurance covers it. So that's, so insurance covers it, and that's why I think there's room to argue for the less expensive therapy. So you have to identify that there's actually an FDA for problem before you do this? The question is, do you have to identify that there's a problem with S3 or S4 before you do sacral neuromodulation? And the answer is no. No, not at all. So I'm going to move on to posterior tibial nerve stimulation, which is not FDA approved for the indication of fecal incontinence or ABL in this country, um, but is approved for the use of urinary incontinence and urge incontinence. And so if you have both mm -hmm. problems and you're interested in trying a nerve stimulation therapy, this can be 
know, an easy way to get it, to give it a trial. Um, right now, one of our national networks is considering a trial of PTNS or poster tibial nerve stimulation for ABL. So we're hoping that within five years or so, we'll be able to prove that it works and have it on the market for that indication, but right now we don't. This therapy involves placing a needle into the skin of the ankle. It's like an acupuncture needle. And then you stimulate, you pass electrical current through the needle for 30 minutes. And you do that every week for 12 weeks. So you have to come and hang out with us on a regular basis if you want to try that therapy. So I have excellent nurses. Um, I am going to touch on the more invasive surgical options now. Sphincterplasty is correcting the sphincter. And that, I, that addresses an isolated anatomic defect. So if there's a tear in the anal sphincter, surgery can fix that. But the results are much better if the problem, if you have a tear and we fix it right then. If you had a tear 20 years ago and we fix it now, it's unlikely that the sphincter is really the problem. It's probably the other things that have happened in the last 20 years. So it has low long-term success rates, and it has pretty high risks of infection and wound separation or persistent or worse symptoms. And so um, what I always tell patients is if somebody recommends that you have a sphincterplasty, you should probably get second opinion before you go through it. Yeah. Um, do these cable exercises every day really help? Do the cable exercises every day really help is the question. Um, and the answer is yes, but they help more if you do them with supervision than if you just do them on your own. Because if you do them with supervision, you figure out how to really do them correctly and you identify whether you're problem is that you're not tightening enough or you're tightening too much and you identify other potential problems. And I think also if you go to supervised physical therapy, it's just like anything else, you know. If, if you go there, you're more likely to do it because somebody's going to get mad at you if you didn't do your homework. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like we're all like that in general with everything. Yeah. Is that covered by insurance? The question is, is physical therapy covered by insurance? And the answer is yes for most patients. Um, so artificial bowel sphincters were a thing in the past. Um, and they're very effective, but they're associated with very, very high rates of complications. And so they're not done right now. There is a new one that's in clinical trials that's a magnetic anal sphincter that does show some promise, um, but it's not available outside of research right now. <coughs> and finally, uh, colostomy is an option. So um, <clears throat> colostomy is when <clears throat> you actually have a bag pulled up to your abdomen and stool comes out through that bag instead of coming out through your anus. And there has been, in recent years, a movement to destigmatize colostomy. Um, and so these are pictures of young women with colostomies that they posted to sort of increase awareness about how common um, and how normal it is to have a colostomy. So I just add that to the um, list of options so that you know that that's there. That's something that a colorectal surgeon would do rather than a urogynecologist like me. So <clears throat> who can help with this problem? I think the best place to start is primary is your primary care provider. Um, gastroenterologists, urogynecologists, and colorectal surgeons can all take care of this problem. And we're very fortunate here right in this building to have something called the Women's Public Wellness Program, which is a multidisciplinary program of clinicians who take care of this problem. Most people, when they talk about bladder or bowel leakage, do so with their general practitioner or their family physician. So that's a very good, comfortable place to start. And so then everybody says, oh, 
gosh, but if I bring it up, then what are they going to do to me? <clears throat> a, a doctor who knows how to take care of this will ask you a bunch of questions about your symptoms to try to figure out when it's happening and what and whether or not there are certain triggers that can be modified. And they'll do a careful physical exam, including a rectal exam, <coughs> the finger in your rectum, <coughs> and looking at the perineum, the skin around the anus. Additional testing is usually not necessary at the beginning of the process. If you've tried the conservative management option and you're still having symptoms, there are a couple of blood tests that can be helpful. And if you're not up to date on your colon cancer screening, will definitely push you to have a colonoscopy because that the uh, colon cancer is something that we can completely prevent with early detection. Additional tests that might be ordered are anal rectal manometry and endoanal sonography. So anal rectal manometry involves placing a thin catheter with a balloon on the end of it into the rectum. And we can measure the pressure in the rectum and the anal canal, and we can inflate the balloon gradually and test your ability to perceive that there's something in the anus. Uh, that, that same balloon testing is sometimes used during the course of biofeedback to help you get more awareness of when stool is being delivered to your rectum. So we had a question from an online registrant about radiation and chemotherapy to treat a prior cancer. Um, and this, this participant can't feel the urge to relieve herself until the stool is on its way out. And so one of the things that I would recommend to this person would be biofeedback if she hasn't had it yet to help try to wake up some of those muscles and nerves and help them communicate together. And then this is the um, probe for the endoanal ultrasound, which is a, it's an ultrasound to look at the muscles of the, in the anal canal. And it um, looks sort of terrifying, but really it's only the very end part that goes inside. So it's Really, no more, no more, more. It's not more invasive than a rectal exam. Not that anybody is like lining up for a rectal exam, but, <laughs> um, but it's not as bad as it looks. So that was why I put those pictures on there because they're they're not as bad. You know, I mean, it's, it's not fun. I'm not going to say it's fun, but it's not that terrible. Quite <laughs> 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 bad. Most people with these problems don't talk to a doctor about it. This is actually because I wouldn't give him any more ice cream. <laughs> but he could have also been having ABL. <laughs> um, and when I first got here, I spent a couple of years studying reasons why, because less than 30% of women with ABL talk to a doctor. And this is a quote from a woman who participated in one of the focus groups around this issue. I never brought this up to a doctor, male or female. It was too embarrassing. It was too ridiculous. It's like I understand that's silly, but I never wanted to discuss it. So I don't mention it. They don't notice it. It's my little secret. Um, so if that's how you feel, if you don't want to bring it up to a doctor yet, there are some good online sources of information. One of them is the National Association for Continents website, nafc.org. Um, Another one is voicesforpfd.org, which is the patient education platform of the American Neurogynecologic Society. There's another website called ablinfo.org. So those are all good information sources if you don't want to talk with somebody yet. If you do want to talk with somebody yet, um, the Women's Public Wellness Program here at the DHC um, is a great place to start. We have a team that includes um, four pelvic floor reconstructive surgeons and a nurse practitioner. We have two clinical nutritionists right in our space. And we have a team of 10 pelvic floor physical therapists who rotate through our clinic. So we're really, really fortunate to have all sorts of resources here to help women with this, and men with this problem. Um, 
And so this, I'm going to close with a quote from a patient I took care of, not from a focus group. I cannot believe this. I haven't had an accident for two weeks. My husband and daughter even noted. Thank you for giving me my life back. So I promise we won't make you sit on our lap. Mm -hmm. But please consider coming to talk to us to get help. If this is a problem and you've exhausted your solution. Um, and now I'm going <laughs> to welcome your questions. Should we take some from, do we have some from the webinar audience that we should start with? Thank you. Okay, do you need surgery every three to five years to replace the battery in the nerve stimulation device? Yes, you do. I keep asking the company when they're coming out with a rechargeable battery. <laughs> uh, I feel like that should be a thing. But I may say be sort of silly to come up with it because then they'll put themselves out of business. But they promise me they're working on it. Is there anything that can be done to control passing gas unexpectedly? Yeah, this is a tough one. It's harder to hold on to gas than it is to hold on to fuel. Um, some of the things that can be helpful, uh, there are medications like Beto or Gastax or Cymethicone that can help. And the pelvic floor muscle strengthening exercises can also help with uncontrolled gas. And sometimes changing your um, diet can improve. You can decrease the gas producing food intake. There's, um, the University of Michigan has a wonderful bowel control program website and that you're allowed to download their informational materials for free. And they actually have a great handout on gas control. And it's, I think it's called Slatus on the website. So if you go to Michigan Bowel Control Program, you can find that. Is it possible? Michigan Bowel Control oh. Program. If you just type that into your Google search engine, you'll come to their website and they have it's very like easy to navigate and they have a patient information tab. I aspire to create that for UW one day. Um, is it possible to have too much fiber that it would cause loose stools? Uh, usually when you have loose stools, the problem is actually not enough fiber. Um, the, if you're wondering if you might have too much fiber, it probably makes sense to see a clinical nutritionist or a dietitian to, to figure out maybe you just need more uh, soluble or insoluble to balance things out. And there are medical conditions for which low fiber diets are recommended. So if anything I'm telling you today, is uh, counteracts what you've been told, contradicts what you've been told by somebody who knows you better than I do, then please ask that person before you make the changes that I suggested. What is the treatment and success rate for treating rectal prolapse? Um, so the treatments for rectal prolapse are mostly surgery. Um, there are surgeries, I <clears throat> I should say, I should give the caveat that I don't do rectal prolapse surgery. The colorectal surgeons do the rectal prolapse surgery, but we often do the operations together because oftentimes somebody has both vaginal prolapse and rectal prolapse. There are operations that can be done through the anus, and there are operations that can be done through the abdomen. If the problem is that there's too much rectum, they'll sometimes, or too much colon, they'll sometimes resect some of the colon to help make it less likely that the rectum will prolapse again. Um, and that's done abdominally. Yes? Would you do prolapse surgery on a 98 year old? Would I, the question is, would, would you do prolapse surgery on a 98 year old? And the answer is yes. Um, yeah. The prolapse operations, there are varying, um, levels of risk associated with different operations. So for somebody, so I would say there's no age cutoff. It all depends on how, how healthy you are and how big of a risk the operation is. But there are pretty minimally invasive operations that can be done just using spinal anesthetic, even for old and infirm patients. So you shouldn't feel like there's an age at which we just say, oh, no, sorry, you missed the boat. Um, oh, thank you. This is somebody with more information about Eclipse Pro.
pricing. Thank you. This is probably somebody from Calvalon. You can, there's a low cost trial version that you can try first. If it's right for you, the annual insert is expected to be around $1,800. And there are also programs to help patients with the cost. That all sounds fabulous. Yes, there was one question that came from the webinar ahead of time. Yes. Did you want to touch on that or just yes. find it for privately? Um, no, I actually kind of already did. Oh, you did. Uh, right. No, no, no problem. Yeah, the question was, um, I've had radiation and chemotherapy, and I have scar tissue and nerve damage at the present time. I can't feel the urge to relieve myself until the stool is on its way out. What can I do to help regain control? And I would say biofeedback, physical therapy with biofeedback would be the, a good first place to start. If you've already tried that, then I would see somebody who specializes in this condition for help with other advanced therapy options. Yeah. So the question is where do rectocele come in? And what a rectocele is, is a relaxation of the back wall of the vagina between the vagina and the rectum. And so what can happen is that stool can get trapped in that rectocele um, and, be, and it can make it difficult to evacuate your stool. Um, rectocele on their own don't usually cause this problem. So if somebody has a rectocele, usually my first focus is on optimizing stool consistency and helping them evacuate. And if they're still having symptoms, then for me that raises the flag of there's something else going on with the continence mechanism. Because a rectocele in and of itself, a relaxation of the wall between the vagina and the rectum shouldn't cause this problem. Yeah. Um, you keep talking about biofeedback. Could you explain a little bit about what that means? Yes. Could I explain a little bit about what biofeedback means? Biofeedback means all sorts of things. Has anybody in this room ever had biofeedback? Um, did you have stickers on you? Anybody have biofeedback with stickers? Yeah. So sometimes biofeedback is putting little stickers on you and connecting those stickers are like electrodes, just like the stickers when you have an EKG. And those stickers get connected up to a screen that then shows you when you do a, a muscle squeeze that you're doing it correctly. That's one form of biofeedback. Another form of biofeedback is putting a probe inside your anus or rectum so that, and then that probe is connected to the screen so that you can see whether or not the pressure is increasing wherever the probe is when you do certain maneuvers. Another form of biofeedback is something like putting a balloon inside the anus and blowing it up and saying, do you feel that? That's what it feels like when there's this much, when there's a stool in the rectum. So biofeedback, bio, body, or life, feedback, giving you some, some feedback other than just do this kegel squeeze on your own. So it can mean a bunch of different things. <clears throat> And we have, we have to get creative because it's not always covered by insurance. So sometimes we end up, you know, sometimes it's not an option it, as, as categorized as biofeedback, but there are a lot of components of physical therapy that include things that give us feedback. Yeah. It's, yes. it's a therapy more than a test. Yeah. Um, you are citing a bunch of different things that like a person could have IBS or Crohn's or whatever. Um, if somebody has better people, is that something that can <clears throat> Yes, the question is, can diverticulitis cause this problem? And the answer is yes, because diverticulitis can cause loose stools, and those loose stools make it harder for to control things. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, diverticulitis can be associated with this condition. Yes. The anti-diarrheal drugs, is there any danger in taking them frequently and for a longer duration? <clears throat> yeah, the question is, is it dangerous to take anti-diarrheal drugs frequently and for a longer duration? 
Um, and I have patients who take the maximum dose of Imodium every single day. And sometimes we even bump it up beyond that. It's something that I would recommend doing with a healthcare provider being aware because there is a danger of getting yourself too constipated and ending up in a situation where you have a bowel obstruction where there is something that you can't move Where I'm sitting, that'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. But most of the people who are taking high doses of Imodium are not at risk of having that happen. <laughs> Uh, but certainly it's good to it's certainly good to engage just like you know just because it's over the counter doesn't mean it's not dangerous you can kill yourself from Tylenol you know I mean we think over the counter means you know relatively safe but not always so you should talk to somebody who knows what's considered a high dose what's considered a high dose of Imodium so the maximum daily dose of Imodium is six which would be eight tabs. Uh, do you have information on the detrimental side of taking oxybutynin or an overactive lens? Yes. Do I have information on the detrimental side effects of taking oxybutynin for an overactive bladder? Well, yes, I do. I prescribe oxybutynin for overactive bladder to lots of people so I can talk about it. The um, oxybutynin is an anticholinergic medication, and that means that it can have some cognitive side effects. And long-term use of anticholinergic therapy can increase our risk of memory problems. So we're pretty careful with using oxybutynin for long periods of time. Oxybutynin has several common side effects like constipation, um, dry mouth, dry eyes, blurry vision. Um, we often use oxybutynin to see if it helps bladder symptoms. And then if it doesn't, we quickly stop to avoid some of those long-term side effects. One more question about medication. Uh, I take pentobidol because I have both colitis and IBS and premium stancidine. Are there bad effects from pentobidol? The question is, are there bad effects from pentobidol? And I am not as familiar with that one but you know, the, the right answer here is ask your pharmacist right. or your doctor. Right. But pharmacists are an undertapped resource. They have a lot of knowledge. So I would recommend asking a pharmacist. This is a question from home. Does biofeedback work for rectal prolapse? Um, I suspect that it can be effective depending on how bad the rectal prolapse is because it works for vaginal prolapse. But the truth is that I don't have a lot of experience specifically with that. We know, we hate to say I don't know. No, that's, that was my point. When you said earlier in the program that you didn't know the answer to that question, I thought that was fabulous. If you don't know, you don't know, and you're not going to make it up. Thank you. <laughs> so that comment was that it's good that I admit that I don't know everything. <laughs> yeah. So remember to follow the protocol to get the syrup after you stop. Uh, the question is, do the memory problems caused by oxygen clear up when you stop using it? Oftentimes they do. So if I, if I, in my practice, if I have a patient who has um, side effects, CNS side effects or brain problems from using a medicine, I usually stop that right away. And then they, they defog. Yeah. Um, for people who are perhaps not part of the UW Health or Unity Insurance System, if they would like a referral to the Women's Health and Wellness Clinic, how do they go about working with their home provider to schedule yeah. an application like you were one of the team um, so this is a question from home about how to get an appointment in the Women's Public Wellness Clinic if you're not in the UW system. Um, and I am not sure I really know the answer to that question. 
what I would start with is asking your primary care provider um, who who are the primary care specialists, either your gynecologist um, or colorectal surgeons or gastroenterologists in your healthcare system. And if there aren't those people, then ask to go to UW. But there might be a better UW answer. Is that something, Gail, that we could get on our website? Sure. I don't. I don't know the answer, but I suspect there is a better answer than that one. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I really appreciate your being here.